Not free, got that beat. going on family it's your brother lawrence here with another episode of watch god work in every episode we get the distinct pleasure and honor to speak to a brother or sister that's doing exceptional work in every field of human endeavor and they share their god story the ways in which god has been at work in their lives but also the ways in which god has been work and their work and today it is no different i have my sister our sister chanel e martin what's going on sis Hello, I'm I'm well. I'm so happy, so grateful, so honored to be here. Thank you for having me. No, nah, I've been so hyped, man, and I've been prepared, man. She got the prophetess hat on. We're ready <laughs> <laughs> to go. Uh, I just love us. I love us because I think you may not even have met. Uh, you connect for the first time, but I think from a kingdom perspective, there's just a knowing, but also just us, a melanation. Um, I think there's also something to that. And I'm so thankful for you. Since I am, uh, you know, I'm so in awe of God when I think about your life and, you know, and I think in the amount of time of studying and studying your story for some mm -hmm. time leading up to this, when we confirm, I said, yo, you know, mom of four, wife, mm -hmm. chemical engineer on the, you know what I mean? But, 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 but like, it's not even just this, <laughs> you know, this engineer, this chemical engineer, that's, that's a different, that's a different vibe. That's a different oh, frequency. <laughs> <laughs> different frequency shout out to your mom who kind of directed you in that in in, in, that, in that light um but you know there were so many different paths you could have taken uh, because of your interests uh, but you have found yourself in this position where you are standing right in the gap of a time when people are recognizing the importance of starting businesses that serve people that solve problems beyond the fact that there's an economic jubilee a portion of people actually taking ownership, building the economic foundation for their families, for their lives, women being able to do that for their families, for their lives, whether that's for neighbors, communities. You're stepping into that on top of just giving people tools to ensure that their story is out, um, ensure that they're writing, ensure that they're accountable in their businesses and they put God at the center of their business. A lot of people say that but I think it's hard to get the practical tools of what this actually looks like. You're doing all of that and more. I can't honor it completely because I'll be here doing my soliloquy, though I know the things you'd be doing. Um, I have to start with who is Chanel E. Martin? Yeah, so, oh my goodness. I am just really multifaceted. And actually, it's recently that I started to accept all that I am. Mm. And I'm not with that. For years, um, I didn't always go by Chanel E. Martin, so I'm glad you put the E in there. Um, I used to go by uh, Chanel Ebony. Uh, that was something that I I identified with. It was like my um, uh, who I was in college. I used to go by the nickname Ebony when I would go out and I was in the world. Now I call myself. Uh, a little bit ratchet and a lot of bit righteous. So <laughs> Chanel Ebony was a little bit of ratchet part of me. But um, in 20, I want to say 2018 or the top of 2019, the Lord told me, he said, change your name. And, and I changed it to Chanel E. Martin. He said, that's the name you're going to go by. So I thought that was interesting. So I wanted to start with uh, with that, because you, you you hear about that, you read about that in the Bible, where God literally forces people to change their name. He was like, you're no longer Chanel Ebony. And I work, was working at a radio station at the time, and I was going by the name Chanel Ebony at the time. And God was like, no, you're Chanel E. Martin. So I went and told the producer, I said, nope, I'm Chanel E. Martin. Let's change it. We're not Chanel Ebony. But um, just in a practical sense, who I, who am I? I am a mom of four. Like you mentioned, I'm a wife. Uh, I am an ordained uh, prophetess. I don't go by prophetess Chanel, but, um, I do allow people to honor me in that manner if they so choose. So, um, you know, just, that's a, a level that I had to walk into and accept that as well and allow people to honor the God given call on my life. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm also a serial entrepreneur. I have a love for all things technology. And I believe that my ultimate gift is to add some sort of digital or technology component to things. And I did that with my first business, my first official business, which is my Avana. 
Um, and that was the, the business that I started with three other ladies from Georgia Tech. Uh, I am a chemical engineer by trade. So I have a bachelor's and master's degree in chemical engineering. And um, I, my mother pushed me in that direction. She saw that I was smart and she felt like that I could really make an impact. And so that's the only reason, literally, why I became a chemical engineer. And I got in it and I realized that I say, you know, this is very challenging. I like solving problems and it was just always something to figure out. So I like figuring things out. Um, I started in life. I wanted to be an actress and a producer. Uh, I wanted to produce plays, movies, shows, productions, commercials, anything in the entertainment or in arts field. Uh, because I went to a, a performing arts school from sixth grade until 12th grade. And so I moved to Atlanta from Oklahoma City, which is where I'm originally from. And I thought I was gonna come to Hot Atlanta um, in the um, in the 2000s, because I graduated high school <laughs> in 2003. So I have to tell y'all that I am dating and aging myself so much, but it, it was a special time in entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we. <laughs> yeah. So I thought that I was gonna come in the uh, in Atlanta and be an uh, 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 engineer and some sort of mogul in the entertainment industry, and I got an engineering school, and it was like, oh no. So I focused on um, engineering, but I always had a strong media uh, desire and media background, and so I had given up on that, and then God has. He's now in this season allowing me to go back to my first love and integrate everything um, that I love doing and everything that I know how to do and that I'm gifted to do. So that's who I am. I, I love this. I love how you teed it up. You know, what I mean, obviously you had to stop between Oklahoma City, the little, little, little Arkansas, little, little Rock, little, little, little Clinton land and then kind of move uh, and then got back to Atlanta. But I think this where you started, I think, is where we should start, which oh. is the hmm, finally accepting yourself mm -hmm. because i think when i when i when you know kind of when you go into the story and i come from family entrepreneurs you know track i was doing multi-event so for me it's always like renaissance do multiple of polyglot you know <laughs> yeah. and, you know but you want to have the focus uh, but it, it but it but there is a, a journey of faith around god is this where the boundary lines are gonna lie for me. Is this the gifting that I have? Is this just the tension? Cause no one's comfortable in this life. Will, there will be trouble, there'll be struggles. Will this be my cross of like the, the, the strain and the work and the toil of the ground for me? And so the fact that you have, uh, you know, accept, found that in acceptance recently, right? You ain't new to this, right? You're not new to this. Um, I, I almost wanna go, I, I almost, I. I I think that's important because I then want to kind of go back a bit to Oklahoma City with this because okay. you know again you're like you know I want to be an act uh, you know actress I, you know I want to be performing a lot so I'm doing all of this you know when did you was it just when your mom directed you that's when you said okay this is this this is the step the stem piece of it this is where I want to go but then ultimately all these other pieces the the arts interests the I'm a problem solver I'm very structured you know the I like to help what parts of that do you see in your childhood and the upbringing where it's like, it's all making sense now. It's all coming back to me now. Like the Celine song, like when, how did it work? Oh my gosh. So you, 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 that's a loaded question, but I love it because I've, I've thought about this. I've had deep conversations. So grateful to my husband, Christopher, who listens to me ponder about myself. Um, because I was always trying to seek understanding about who I am from the lens of other people and then uh, from my own lens, because that's what you do when you're suffering an identity crisis, right? You're trying to figure out, well, like, who, who am I? And unfortunately, I did not have the best relationship with my dad. So that piece of identity that's passed on through your father, I never got. Um, and God had to give that to me and I had to f go on a journey. And so we did end up reconciling before he passed, but I was a full grown woman with kids <laughs> at this point. Um, so, you know, I had to kind of do some searching, but it, let's, let's go back. I, I love Oklahoma city. I don't talk about it as much. It's where my, it's my roots. I recognize that that is where I'm from and I will never deny that. 
And, um, and it's where I just, where I, where I got started. Now, my mother is, uh, originally from Arkansas a small town called Star City, Arkansas. And she moved to Oklahoma City for, I guess, what she felt would be a better life. Now, I don't know why of all the states she could have picked, <laughs> she picked Oklahoma City. And I have to say that because it's important because we didn't have family there. So it's not like I am uh, born and bred uh, from Oklahoma City. I actually, my m majority of my family uh, lives in Arkansas and Louisiana and California. So we moved into Oklahoma and we had to create a family uh, and create resources surrounding us. And, and so we had people that weren't really my cousins. I called them cousins, grandparents that weren't really grandparents, aunts that weren't really aunts and uncles that weren't really uncles. OK, so that's uh, and when you think about that, I think that also shapes identity because I didn't have them in my uh, close proximity. Now, I did spend a lot of time. I would go home with some, uh, go back, and I call Arkansas home, actually. Uh, I would go back there in summers and every holidays. My mother made sure that I had a really good relationship with my family, which helped me to uh, really appreciate family. And so just going back to Oklahoma City, uh, there was a school called Class and School of Advanced Studies in Performing Arts. And when I was in the fourth grade, they were opening it up. It was a new thing. And um, so in fifth grade, I had the opportunity to apply to go to the school. I remember they came to our elementary school. They talked to us and they basically were like, hey, tell your parents, you, you know, you want to apply to come to this school. You had to apply. Um, they had two parts. They had uh, a part for smart people called IB and then they had a performing arts part. And I always knew that I was made for the camera. I was just so, I don't want to call it a fabulous. I was just so over the top. And they used to call me a drama queen growing up. And I just did the most. There we go. Did the most. <laughs> and I see that in my oldest daughter, Cece, who's six. She is me all the way. And so I knew, I knew that was for me. And I will never forget in the fifth grade, you had an application and you typically ask your parents, you know, they fill out your application. I did my own application. OK, I went and found every certificate, every spelling bee award. And I put that thing together. And I remember handing it to my mom as a fifth grader saying, I want to go to this school. Then you had to prepare an audition piece. Well, I was Helena in a Midsummer Night's Dream in the fourth grade. And so I prepared an audition piece in the fifth grade and I did Helena from a Midsummer Night's Dream as a fifth grader reciting Shakespeare. So I went on to class and of course I got in and I did phenomenal there in their performing arts program. I won many awards, broke records uh, in the state of Oklahoma. I competed in uh, uh, theater and speech competitions and even went on to be Miss Black Oklahoma City. Um, but I knew that there was more. So in the process of doing that, my mother and, and, and I love her, but I'm going to be honest. 100% honest. She didn't feel like uh, acting or performing arts was going to be a very lucrative career for me. And she, in her mind, she wanted better. So I was naturally smart. And she said, look, you know, your test scores are good. How about you become an engineer or do something in science or technology? And at this time, I didn't even think anything about it. I wasn't anywhere interested. And she put me in a summer camp, a STEM camp at Langston University, which is um, a historically black college in uh, Oklahoma. And I went there my freshman year, after my freshman year, so she really started, you know, the college talks. And I met a chemical engineer. And I started looking at what they were doing and I said, I could do that. Okay. So I started, my mind was open. You know, and I feel like that's a testament of sometimes we don't know what we can be until someone shows us. Mm. So my mind was open. I said, okay, I'll, I'll be an engineer. And it sounded good. You know, people were like, ooh, chemical engineer. I had a cousin at Tuskegee at the time who was much older than me who had studied chemical engineering. I called her and she was like, oh, you make all this money. I'm like, seriously. I was like, oh, I'll, I'll be paid. Okay. I can do that. And then, and then I found purpose in it. I said, well, you know what? I also, my second love is beauty, hair, skin, makeup. I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I said, I'm going to become a chemical engineer and I'm going to do something in the hair care industry. I'm going to do something with beauty. 
And um, that's that's really how I shaped my my world around becoming an engineer. And uh, I ended up going to college. Uh, we found uh, Clark Atlanta University and I went on campus and I was like, oh, this is my school. And they had a, a engineering dual degree program. And um, I did that dual degree with Georgia Tech. And then after the economy crashed in 2009, I had to leave because I couldn't get any loans. So uh, I was uh, uh, able to finish up in North Carolina a and where I got my master's degree. And then now after that, I meet. Uh, the Lord gives me a dream. So this is how we get into entrepreneurship again. Okay. So I'm, I, you know, sometimes what was on the inside of me, the theater part, I didn't get to do it in, in college. It was too much. Engineering was hard. I barely made it out, but I made it out. <laughs> and I just had decided, you know what? I started settling. I was like, okay, I could just go work at the paper mill, which is what I worked at. I worked at the paper mill and, um, and I, I had some of the best internships from BP to Marathon Oil to Georgia Pacific, you name it, top tier companies. I said, oh, you know, I can go make my, my little $75,000 and, and be straight and drive my Lexus and have my big house in the summer. And I'll be good. And at this point, I've met my husband. Well, we didn't know we was going to be married, but and he was a chemical engineer. So I started painting this picture for my life. I'm like, OK, I'll just be the rich auntie. Uh, the wealthy auntie and just kind of started, I just gave up. Yeah. And then one day in preparing for marriage in preparing for my marriage, I was trying to find wedding hairstyles. I was so frustrated. Yeah. I was looking on this website and I had natural hair. I just went natural and I went to sleep and I had a dream and I saw what is now my Ivana. That's an app store. You can download it. I saw it in 2011 and that sparked something on the inside of me. And that is how I got my start in entrepreneurship. Just, I know I said a lot, but no, I want to pause. Is, <laughs> no, this is this is so. I love the journey you kind of take the, you take the take us on that. I think the 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 notion of just the practicality. I think sometimes people are on extremes of it has to be dreamy. There's no practical or utility of okay. Uh, I was led through something I thought would be ultimately how I would you know support my family, do well. I leaned into that. But even then, still, I was open and heard and received kind of a vision for something that I, again, I could not anticipate. It was from a pain point. It was from something in need, right? And, and I think more than anything else, it's just like you know, I, I, I sometimes. Well, I appreciate your story is that I think we sometimes make it too esoteric, meaning that God has come for some, He's come for us, right? In in the great story, the great love story, right? But it was to solve. We had a problem. There was a problem at hand. <laughs> There's a problem that needed to be solved and him coming was, was resolving that. I think to some degree, the fact that it started from a burden, you're like, mm. <laughs> like I can't find this or I'm looking this. It gave birth to something there. So I, so <laughs> now, this serialness, now, I, you know, I, I think entrepreneurs I call like the, the, the quit, it's hard to find quit, right? It's like, I don't know what bottom is because in faith, something can turn. And so what was your experience with, with that first business and then kind of the subsequent business early on that kind of really gave you a different side of God. God formed you differently in that time. Like, what did you see in that experience that really, really helped you? Oh, my gosh. So um, what I didn't mention was prior to my line, I had a business and we called it Proximity Creative Agency. And what we did was <laughs> we staffed models for events. Mm -hmm. Now, that came from this big fashion show I did at Georgia Tech. I didn't even know I could do a fashion show. And I packed out, I think it's called the First Center at Georgia Tech because I, I guess, I, you know what? I think I'm somebody. You give me a problem. I'm going to solve it and I'm going to do it well. So the ladies, I, I was really good at getting volunteers. I was really good at getting people to help me. Uh, that's a gift. And we we executed well. I was just able to put people where they needed to go. And um, the ladies that I asked to help, we said, hey, we should make this a business. Everyone was just like high off of like what we were able to do. And so we started Proximity. Well, uh, after I left Georgia Tech and had to finish up and end up finishing up at North Carolina a t it kind of sizzled out. But there was still something in me that wanted to do something. I was like, I knew I knew I was supposed to do something. And I'll never forget while I was at Georgia Tech, I sat in my 
apartment and they had black in America being black and being in tech. It was like black in America and they were doing stuff about uh, tech startups in Austin, Texas. Yeah. So if anybody's waiting for the divine moment, the I sat there and I'll never forget. And I watched that. I said, there was a lot of tech startups and incubators and, you know, I got to put something in your space. It's going to be me someday. I didn't know what for. I said, that's gonna be me and if you and if you if i dated myself but i was an early adopter on facebook right when they had to add your school <laughs> and it was no wall there was no messenger uh you know one of the first uh, uh people on facebook me and mark zuckerberg are the same age uh we're in college at the same time so i i was seeing this this technology this digital space this social media social networking thing blowing up so when you when i always have this seed in me i'm and I'm just, okay, one day God's going to open up a door for me to be them. And he did. He did. So, you know, we, we, I, I get into, the Lord finally shows me my entry into the tech space. Okay. I'm a chemical engineer. I don't know anything about coding. And so God shows me as he always does. Uh, I call it heaven's uh, HR department shows me who's supposed to help me. So I reach out to Candace and I, I knew she was a computer scientist. I said, look, I don't know nothing about coding, but I'm a chemical engineer and we can make something happen. <laughs> and um, we ended up, she ended up knowing two other girls who were computer scientists at Georgia Tech. And we got together and we blew up fast. I mean, blew up like we were on Black Enterprise. We're on um, Melissa Harris Perry show. When she said, "Have that," uh, we've we've been in Ebony. We've been in Essence, uh, the real. Um, and then even after my departure, the company still is is showing up in headlines. And because our story was just so unique, I mean, you had four black women in technology, and I'm again dating myself. Back in 2012, when we hit the scene in Atlanta, we were literally the face of black women in tech. Mm -hmm. And I don't talk about that much, but it, it's true. We won. They had like this big tech tech war award. Uh, I can't think of the name of it. The, no, I think it's the Technology Association of Georgia, the Tag Business Launch Competition. And look, all of this, you can Google all of this and find it. And we won that in 2013. We beat out 70 other startups. There was a, a, um, a startup incubator here in Atlanta called a Flashpoint. And we were part of the second cohort. We got $30,000 for our idea. No product, no nothing. Just an idea idea and they funded the development um then we would go on and um get into uh, i forgot the name of the it's a atdc which is in tech square and we were part of their incubator program then we would go on to do dream adventures which is based out of philly and we were part of their program then we ended up getting into ndvc which back uh companies such as the shade room and many other companies we were in the same cohort with um angelica as well from the room then we would go on and um we got accepted to be the first cohort of sephora accelerate um and then in that tenure uh we were named a forbes 30 under 30 company so all of these things were happening and it made sense because i was like well i already knew i was supposed to be in front of the camera <laughs> it came, so it came like, through okay, a different god. path came through a different path i said okay god I see you. I get to use my engineering background. We developed, um, what we did was we developed a uh, system to help you figure out uh, your hair using uh, uh, a scanning electron microscope um, and a product recommendation engine. I recently signed a patent uh, for that. We had a provisional patent and we're uh, submitting the final patent to the U.S. Patent Office. I think I signed that like last week. So I will uh, have be a, a patent owner, which is an amazing yes. <laughs> accomplishment for what we did for a hair, a hair, a natural hair company at the time. And so, so that, right. So, so I, I have to tell you that story is so important because even with all of that, God told me in 2015, he said, I need you to leave. leave and I, I felt it when we had went to LA to be on the real it was like something was in my spirit and it was like guys getting ready to transition me and I felt it and I went on a fast because I was like okay something God's trying to talk to me about something and I heard him and he said you gotta go he said I need you to step down you're gonna tell your partner she's gonna be mad <laughs> but I'll deal with her and I need you to go 
And because I need you to walk in who I called you to be. So I call you prophet. And I need you to come and get my entrepreneurs and help my entrepreneurs. We're talking about 2015. And I cried and I called my pastor at the time. He was like, are you sure? Do another fast, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I said, no, nah, I'm sure. I couldn't have made this up. And the, the encounter I had was just so phenomenal. I just, I couldn't, it, I couldn't make this up. So uh, uh, <laughs> with uh, lots of frustrated people, because I had re raised money. I did a, a friends and family round. I think my portion alone was like 20 or 30,000 uh, <laughs> from my family. They didn't understand. They're like, we invested this money. And da -da -da -da, you know, and everybody said, well, I, the company's not shutting down, y'all. I just got to go. And um, I got ridiculed for leaving mm. and but I didn't care I knew I knew the, if anybody had been in that prayer closet in my house and had the encounter that I had you would have left too okay <laughs> so I left and um at this time my company my cut my in-laws were starting a company called minute weave y'all we created a velcro wig you can go look that up too it went viral <laughs> and same thing essence yahoo uh, I forgot what else we were on. Black Enterprise. All, same thing. It happened very quickly. And then, unfortunately, to just uh, make things to say it nicely, it didn't work out for me and my husband to be a part of that. Mm. And so we stepped away after not even a year. Um, I was pregnant with my second child. So um, I have to tell you this. So now, um, in my eyes, I'm a failure. Mm. I had to leave my first one, even though I didn't fail, but I had to leave. I had to leave. So it, to me, it felt like I didn't see it through. Then my second one, I had to leave. The, well, I don't know if I had to. I left. <laughs> we, I was like, this is too much. So I left. And so now I have two startups that I don't work. And I'm just sitting here, like, pregnant and feeling like I'm, I'm a nothing. And watching my peers, um, I remember uh, her name is Jewel Burks. Oh, shout out She's to Jewel Burks. Yes. Shout out. Yes. Shout out. I, I, I don't know if she remembers me, but I remember we went to the Black Enterprise Summit and we sat next to each other and we both looked at her and said, we about to quit our job. She said, you about, I said, I, I said, I'm about to quit my job. She said, yeah, I'm about to quit my job. She told me about her start. I was like, yeah, I'm quitting. Um, being I'm going to go full time in this thing. And we went back and we both quit our jobs. And just to be able to watch people like her, these are my peers, okay? Um, they're having exits. They're, you know, they're getting acquired, like all these people. And I'm in the apartment at the time, we sold our house, we sold everything for my pursuit of entrepreneurship. I'm sitting in an apartment with a two-year-old pregnant and a stressed out husband. And I'm like, God, this ain't what I signed up for. Mm. But God allowed, he sat me down, literally. He sat me down to raise me up because there was no way that I could have the wisdom and the understanding of the deep things of God. I didn't have that then. I wasn't always, I, I didn't have that wisdom. I had some, but not in the capacity that I had. And I went through the school of the Holy Ghost and God began to pour his spirit into me. I didn't have a mentor, books. I mean, he would just wake me up, dreams, visions. It was back to back to back to back to back. And I was always studying and I was always praying because God was like talking to me, was just all coming to me. And I looked crazy, I'm sure. My husband used to make fun of me, call me, say I was doing the night's watchman. I'm up here speaking in tongues. I'm praying. Because now God starts, because I can sat down, he starts showing me. My husband got depression. Got generational cursing finances. You know, you're, you're dealing with uh, anxiety. All these things. And so God begins to give me strategy. So I'm like, well, how do we get out of it? He starts giving me strategy. And I put it in my book, 31 Prayers for Spiritual Wealth. Because he just showed me like, he, this is, I just was like, okay, well, I'm going to show people maybe if, if I, I didn't know any of this. So I know my peers don't know this. And at the time we're, we're, we're just to paint the picture where we are because technology has played a huge part in the accessibility of knowledge and information. And at this time, uh, Facebook live people, I don't even know if Facebook live existed yet, but we were on Periscope's Periscope yeah, nation. Yeah. <laughs> and so we started seeing the emergence. Now we find out that there are like people that are like prophets, right? I'm, I'm hearing God tell me that's what I am. And I'm like, well, I ain't never seen one. Uh, I grew up Baptist in my church. We didn't, we didn't honor the fivefold. So I'm like, God, you telling me something that I thought didn't exist anymore. That I thought only happened in Bible times. And, um, 
And so now I'm finding leaders like Apostle Matthew Stevenson and out of All Nations Worship Assembly in Chicago, who's my my senior leader. Um, I serve at All Nations Worship Assembly Atlanta and where I'm an ordained prophet uh, here. And I find him. He begins to speak to my spirit woman. And so I start growing in the things of God. And then. I want to say, and I gave God a series of yeses, like, okay, God, now I see. God started showing me, yeah, this is what's stopping their finances uh, because they got a generational curse on their finances, or, you know, they have unrepented sin, or they're suffering from rejection. I start seeing a spiritual component as to why people were not as, as successful in business. And God, he said this, and I put this, I quote this all the time, it's on my book. The Lord told me, he said, um, he said, as money answereth all, as money is the answer to all things, when Christians have his money, when we facilitate, when the, when, the, when the wealth facilitates and flows through his Christians, his people, then we become solutions. Mm. So God was raising up kingdom solution is to be the answers for the church. Mm. And so after that, um, I'm thinking, OK, I'm going to go back in the hair industry you know, I'm like, oh, I got my ass. I didn't broke all the curses. And God was like, nope, nope. And then in 2019, he laid this publishing. He gave me, wrapped up in a bowl, Beyond the Book Media as a publishing company. And that's just kind of like where I'm at. This, this, so that's my journey. This is this is perfect. I'm like, I'm holding, I want to hold this. I'm going to put a, I'm going to put a bookmark in this. I want, I wanted you, I wanted you to let that, let that rock. And I wanted you to, to, to be able to speak that all the way through because, you know, the, the, there is there is the picture of this nonlinear journey um, that you've had, right? Um, you know, with business and God, and even you know, I always say that God doesn't always call us to success per se, right? So, for example, you could argue that the obedience of you know the story of the book of Abraham was just like, yeah, you told me to sacrifice my my child, but God keeps speaking, right? If I if I thought God had already given and I, I would have killed my child. But God keeps speaking, even though that was the first call, right? And so mm -hmm. I, I think that's helpful for people to hear, especially if, again, if they didn't grow up in church or this is not their background, right? Just the reality of, you know, I'm doing what I believe I'm supposed to do and things don't always work out the way I want them to. And also I'm getting called in detours that I couldn't even imagine, nor do I know how to get up out of it. And then also in this time, my decisions have an impact on those around me. So now I'm not only grieving the reality of what's happening, I'm also dealing with the just the just the burden, emotional burden, the hurt, the kind of the mourning with what the impact on my family and things. And so I just think that's very, very important to hear. The, the, this, this component, I just, if you could tease this out for us a bit, mm -hmm. which is when God got real, because it, it seemed like there was just there was this harmony and dance with God, even from you speaking earlier around, you know, receiving a dream. And, you know, and starting from there, but where, where did God become real for you, realer for you, right? You know, beyond growing up and, and building, when to become real for you? Because then I want to kind of dovetail back to where, where it is now. God became real to me. Oh my gosh. In 2015 mm. and 2015 in prayer closet, because I've always heard God. And it was like a little still small voice mm. and a knowing. Mm. But when God calls your name, like and you hear an audible, it and it was just such a profound thing. And then my body tingled for like two weeks straight. It was like the Holy Ghost came up on me and I couldn't shake it. And that right there, and then he started, um, I had never really I don't want to say played around or tested God, but I, I, I tell this story when God talked to me because I didn't believe it. He was having this whole conversation. With me. I said, this ain't God. This is my mind. This, and I said, God, if this is you, tell me something. I, I don't know. And I said, we were, we would put our house on the market. I said, where, where are we going? We're going to get our first offer on the house. The Lord said, 15 days from when you put it on the market. I said, I tell my husband, I said, well, I believe I heard God say 15 days from when we put our house on the market, we're going to get our first offer. Mm. Sure enough, we're riding in the car. Our realtor calls, hey, we got an offer. And I, I was excited. And the Holy Ghost was like, check the date. I said, 15 days. <sighs> you know, <laughs> and it just so happened that it was still in the middle of my fast. 
So um, I think it was like the third or fourth day in. So it was still, I was still able to count. And I was like, oh my gosh, wait a minute. Wait, hold up. I can like hear here. And I started having a series of encounters like that, that I just couldn't explain. Mm. See, before mm. it was, okay, daughter, whisper. I don't know if they felt like suggestions. It was like God was being so gentle. Mm. All right, way to do that. And then now, and I see why now in 2021, it's like God put a demand and urgency. It's like God was like, Chanel, all right. Now, I done let you play, and I've been talking to you all these years, but I have need of you in 2019. And I need you to be at a certain level by 2019. So we're going to have to speed this thing up. And that's exactly what happened. Mm. <laughs> yeah, this, I, I like this because now we, we, we're getting in that, we're getting in more of that action, right? I went on at the time, but they're like, I, we're getting more of the action because uh, here's, the, here's the thing. You, I'm speaking, I'm preaching to the choir here. I think sometimes people deal with God light, right? You know, um, I'm gonna put a little God sprinkling seasoning on it, meaning that I'm godly. I'm, I'm, I'm wanna be someone who listens to God, follows God. You know, I wanna be out and being a good witness in the workplace and business and the light. And, you know, I sprinkle a little God on it, you know, that God, you know, I go to church and I pray to God, it helps me with my decisions and this. But just, I think this idea of this supernatural, big, I speak with intention. I've ordained you to be a part of this time. The idea, even beyond those who are not, again, like I said, for most audience who are not, you know, growing up in the church, it's like this idea of even the fivefold ministry, even before that, it's just kind of like prophets? What? Right? So it just <laughs> seems like for, you know, people who are a very empirical based business, mm -hmm. I need to see, show me the Excel, that this just seems over the head. And so, I, mm -hmm. so I, I think this is is powerful because I think that you can't help it. It's just like it became real because like I, literal things happened. I had real literal encounters with God that I could not deny. On top of that, that I, I it was just it was just a real need. The timing and things are showing up in the world that you're you're navigating. Because I can imagine you're navigating when you're talking niche and niche with, with 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 young with small business owners, successful many black women. And then you're again, but you're serving beyond like you're serving everyone in many instances. But then you're also operating in kind of the faith community, faith world. Just is how do you navigate just sometimes some of the smoke and some of the challenges that may come from people who are just seems this seems so foreign that God would be put so forcefully. And what are you talking about and pr making pro you know prophetic perspectives around business? It just again, it just brings up people's questions. How have you been able to navigate that with God? How has God been able to speak to you and, and keep your head on focus around the assignment that he's given you? Oh, that's such a great question, too, because, God, I am a literal walking miracle and testimony. Mm. So I have uh, recorded miracles. I used to suffer from rheumatoid arthritis. Mm. I had it for 10 years. Had, they used to call me the robot lady, robot girl in college. I got it in college. Mm. God healed my body completely. After he called me in 2015 and 2016, he told me he was going to heal me. I'll never forget. I heard him. You know, it, 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 I heard him. He said, you've asked me for everything, but you never asked to be healed. And I said, wait a minute. That's the truth. And it started, th it, had me, it challenged me to think like, what else am I not asking for? Am I only asking to get out of situations mm. and for blessings? <laughs> am, am I not asking for, for the impossible? The doctors told me I'd have it for the rest of my life. It's a chronic condition. Mm. My mother is diagnosed with it. Several members of my family are diagnosed with it. I was the first one to get diagnosed with it. No one knew what it was. They were like, is it lupus? Is it you know, arthritis at that time was still a very new diagnosis. Mm. Okay. I don't have it anymore. The Lord healed me just, and, I, I, and my husband's very practical, y'all. I have to tell y'all this. So he is not like me at all. He is probably who you're talking about. Okay. Very, very linear, very, very practical. You know, and being married to me, I'm sure is a whirlwind. Oh gosh. Uh, and I, so God uses my fruit and, and, and he knows I'll have a big mouth and I talk a lot and I'm going to tell people, I think that's why he chose me because I can't keep things to myself. I remember we were supposed to go out of town and I had this drink. God woke me up. He had, I had this drink and I wrote it down. And cause I started asking God for healing. 
I started praying these scriptures. I said, well, I think I remember the, you know, I think I remember my pastor saying, if you pray the word of God, he got to an answer. And that's literally all I had, y'all. I had no other anything. I just found some scriptures. I said, scriptures on healing, Google. All right. I found five, put them on a notepad and started saying, God, you said da 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 Okay. That's all I did. Didn't even halfway believe it. Okay. I have to preface that. One night after about two weeks of doing this, um, uh, the Lord sent me a dream and I had went, there was this big healing conference, uh, I think it's Reinhard Bunky. And he was like, he said, I went to that conference. I sat next to somebody and they laid hands on me and I was healed. And I woke up and God was like, you need to go to that conference. And I was, I had never been to any of those. I thought those things were loony. I thought everybody was lying. They were fake. I'd never been to any healing, anything. And I remember I said, change of plans. We're going down to the Georgia Dome. We're about to go to this conference, this healing conference, the stadium filled with thousands of people. And we're going to go. So we went. I said, and I and I and I told Chris, my husband, exactly what God said was going to happen. I had never been. And he read it. We got there exactly to the T. How the it, it happened. And I remember. I said, Chris, look, look, I have it written down. I have it written down. Look on my phone. Look, look, it's happening. And to, to have a physical manifestation, I was healed. Now, it wasn't instantaneous because I remember I still had a little bit of pain. But I remember leaving and I said, it didn't work. My wrist still hurt. And my husband said, just give it a moment. And then I forgot about it. Then a year later, I realized that I hadn't taken any medicine and that I was healed. And so these are the things that happen. And so we got people that I grew up with, that I went to college with, that saw me taking all this medication, that saw the pain. And now I can say, well, I haven't taken medicine since 2016 in five years. Those are the encounters that I share that God allows me to have that is just verifiable fruit of his manifestation. And it's done in such a way that it's not spooky, that it's real practical. I can usually trace. I don't want to say like, you don't always have to trace a mirror, but I can tell you like there was a strategy behind it. And so, yeah, that's how I navigate through those things. This is helpful. And I like how you, how we're in the, talking about the physical because, you know, it, it has to be of God. We live in this time, I was having this conversation with another another sister and brother, we always talk about just sustainable rhythms, right? You know, our work has fallen, um, you know, and I think the manifestation of what's happened in this country, what's happened to the black family, uh, what undue burden that is put on many sisters, it's manifested in their bodies from fibroids to things, the stress levels are beyond measure. I think about the fact I'm like, four businesses, you got two, you did that and then two, and I'm, I'm always thinking of like, man, God is guiding her. But how do you, one, for yourself, maintain a healthy rhythm of just the switching costs between multiple businesses of like, okay, I have the book here. All right, I have the scribe here. I got the 21 days to kind of write the book here. I, you have these things that are serving and helping people, right? But that comes out. Mm -hmm. that, 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 is, that is spiritual. All that energy is coming out. And then on top of that, what you're actually teaching this generation that is hungering for guidance but sometimes there are many people, and I've always been guilty of this as an entrepreneur, like you, you sometimes are operating out of fear of like, yo, I just, I got to do, I, this is not working. So I, let me add another one. This is not working. It's not enough. And you got like 10 things and there's really no deep trough being dug. So just, could you talk through how God guides you or how you just kind of let God speak into that? What does that look like for yourself to make sure you're in a healthy rhythm? But then how do you at least speak to those who, who, who are receiving your help and your services? Man, so it's a lot. Of, okay, so I'm a unique individual in which I am a very artistic, dreamy, smart, practical person. Mm. <laughs> All in one. <laughs> All in one. And sometimes they're at war with each other, but I think that's what helps me um, and in the practicality that I uh, apply. So you have in a Christian in Christianity and in faith and business and and in church context because I watched it happen in my church. Love them, but I watched it and I watched it happen in other faith based communities. You either have one or the other. Mm -hmm. So you have all this faith, you have all this naming and claiming, you have all this. God's gonna make a way, 
but there's no strategy, no action, nothing really put towards it. So you got a community of people that they got a prophetic word that they're going to be a millionaire and now they're chasing it instead of strategizing around it. But then if you go look into the deeper things of God and you read your, your, your Bible, you realize that there was so much wisdom. Whenever God instructed anybody to build anything, they always list the measurements. They list the strategy behind the structure. When you think about that, right? And so I think in, in the faith-based community, there's practicality that's missing. And that's why you have a lot of non-believers they apply practicality and they're doing biblically based principles too. The Bible says if you work, you, you deserve a wage <laughs> like that, that there's nothing supernatural about that. That's the way of the world. If you do your job and you do it well and you stick to it and you stay consistent, you will see fruit period. But what I believe our uh, faith based communities uh, give us in, in times where we're looking for miracles instead of strategy. Mm. And so you, you can't live your life just expecting God to come down and put a miracle on every single thing that he equipped you to do. And so uh, we did a prayer call for Kingdom Business Network. And I said um, in a prayer call, it came out and said, don't expect grace to take you places where your discipline should. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 I'm sorry. And, Discipline wasn't important, and I'm a champion for discipline. If discipline wasn't important, it wouldn't said that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and self-discipline. That's on the back of and the phone. And so in the faith-based, <laughs> faith-based communities, a lot of times we teach miracles, supernaturals, wonders without the discipline. Without and, and discipline hurts. Caught up in the spirit feels good. It's amazing. But discipline doesn't feel good. And so, however, I don't know if that came from my mom. I'm going to have to say it came from my mom. She instilled a work ethic in me, a discipline. She gave me the gift of discipline that has carried me. And I'm able to see things through. Like you literally got to pry me out of something. The Lord has to come down and say, or it has to be so traumatic or something for me to say, you know what? All right, this, uh, I'm head out. Uh, this isn't working. And so if people would, uh, uh, if you can, man, let me tell you something. The supernatural mix with your self-discipline and consistency, that is the birthing ground for miracles. Think about it. Why does the Bible instruct us to pray without ceasing? The pray without ceasing is the discipline that you're adding to your prayer life. So from a so when you, there is some practical, we can't totally throw out practicality because there are many practical points in the Bible, and God gets to decide how He wants to to blow on it. And I, and and one last thing I'll say, and, and the Lord revealed this to me, and this was just amazing. This this was so juicy and so yummy to me. He said this to me. He said. He said, many people, he was like, many people want success and they just want instant success. He said, but success takes discipline. Even the guy says, even if he is just drop something in your lap and you just have instant success, it takes discipline to maintain it. So either it takes discipline for you to get it or it takes discipline for you to maintain it. Either way, you have to be disciplined or success is going to fall out of your grips. So, yes, we can name it, claim it. God blow on our business. Give me a million dollars tomorrow. Yes. Amen. Somebody shout me out. But do you even have the discipline to maintain the demand? And that's where I feel like God has put me in space to help people merge both. Yo, this 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 is the word. This this is I think this is word for everybody. Right. I, I, I think, you know, whether the conversation that people toss it up to luck, though we know as God in these things, right? Um, or, you know, for those who are of faith, who, who you know, again, I, I, this is, you, you've touched on, I think it's a, it's a hornet's nest, but a good one. The hornet's nest is this, like, the, hornet, the hornet's nest is this. Sometimes I think that there's a, there's a very dangerous theology, I've seen this, and a lot of times you see this around the conversation around relationship. Like, it's like the good news is, is, is that, is that, 
in, in lieu of the good news, you get God. You don't get things. You got, you, God is the gift, right? All the things that come yes. from the gift giver, right? But, you know, I think there's this view of that, like, everything that I desire, everything I have, like, God gave, you know, God gives me the promises of my, the desires of my heart. He's like, yeah, God gives you the desires of your heart, but not all the desires in your heart. It's a difference, you know, because especially it's this notion and this idea that, you know what, like, everything on this side of glory will come to pass. I just need to be here. And it's just like, mm-hmm. no, you know, like you got to paddle, you got, you got to, you got to work. There are some, there are certain paintings that won't be done on this side of glory because completion comes when he comes back. And so I think to your point, I think this gives people some amount of urgency because they just think that God, you'll finish it. You're the author and the finish, you're the father of my faith. It's just like, no, but you still have to work. You lack the discipline. There, God will grace you in another way. It may come through something else. You may not, but you may not get that. Right. There is an interaction. And so I think that's a scary proposition because so much of the theology, so much of I think what people built on is just that this guarantee faith. And it's like if you feel that you could deserve anything that has nothing to do with God, because nothing of God is is something you've earned, per se. But it's grace. But still, God's trying to form us through the work. It's beyond that. So I I just I I say it's a hornet's nest because it really is because you're speaking truth. But it's a scary proposition. It's almost like. God, you know, search me, prove me, like test my, like God, your will be done. That if you really think about that, that's a scary that's thing. That's scary. <laughs> so you know, so I, I, I'm just, I'm thankful that you're in this space. I'm thankful that you've been navigating in this, and I think this is partly of the blessing, you know, that you're you're giving to these times. Could you? I need, I need to have you say it. How do you help brothers and sisters, those who are recipients of help? Do this in a sustainable way. This grind culture. Again, I'm about hard work. I got family entrepreneurs. I'm about that. Get it up early. Bop, 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 bop. I'm working. I'm working. But I'm seeing people fall out. Mental illness. People fall out. Mm-hmm. What are you saying to them? What can you say to what sh- can you say to them today in view of that? What have you been saying to them in lieu oh. of what you're equipping them with? Yes. So there, there are a few things, and it, first of all, if it's, if it's, you know, if God has given it to you, then He's going to grace you for it. Now, many people that are in grind culture are doing a bunch of busy work and not things that God has given them. One of, the, and I, I am, I, I am a former member, a car carrying grind society person, and the Lord, and I knew it was wrong, and um, and I had to tell myself for a year, I had to tell myself I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I was a workaholic. I felt like if I didn't work, I wouldn't go eat. I mean, if I didn't, yeah, I wouldn't go eat if I didn't work. There we go. If I didn't, if I didn't work, I wouldn't go eat. Like, it wasn't going to get done. And God started showing me like, oh, there's some stuff that I can't do without you. There's some stuff that all you got to do is show up. But they, it usually requires an initial step of obedience. And so there is a grace that comes up on doing the God things and not the good things. Mm. So... We will follow the pattern of our favorite social media influencer and we'll stalk them and we'll do what they do. And we're not graced for that. So we don't know. Like for a prime example, I get up, I do prophetic planning for your day every morning um, inside of our inside of Kingdom Business Network on the clubhouse. And we just recently started opening up where we're going to swap out and give me a break because, Lord, I'm tired. But <laughs> but. And I knew, and I knew, there we go. I knew that I needed to transition because I was getting ex- exhausted. So it's called raising up teams. That's a, a main thing. But what people don't realize is God gives me that complete word in 45 minutes. For somebody else, it might take you a day of fasting, prayer, praying, searching, seeking. And God gives me the entire word typed up, written out, with notes, and bullet points in 40 Five minutes. Now that doesn't include the praying and the fasting that I do regularly to maintain the access point that I have to heaven. But you can't compare what you do because you may try to do what I do and it might try to kill you. Because you don't have the grace for the Lord knows that I got four kids. The Lord knows that my time is limited. So he speeds up time for the things that he's graced me to do. Mm. That's supernatural. And so when you find yourself burnt out, when you find yourself frustrated, it's time to take a look and say, hey, am I doing what God said or what I said? Uh. And and reevaluate. That's one. Number two, 
therapy. I go to therapy. Mm -hmm. I see a therapist bi-weekly. Um, ironically enough, she's not a Christian therapist. I'm like, I'm enough. For, I'm around enough prophets and apostles and spiritual people. I just want somebody to just go, go by the book mm -hmm. <laughs> and tell me, give me some real strategies and I can filter it through my Holy Spirit lens. Yeah. That's what I had to do. I'm not telling you not to go get a Christian therapist. I'm telling you what I did. You said from my mouth. So that's what I want. I didn't want, I wanted to get out of, I'm in over spiritual everything. I just want some practical stuff. So I see a therapist every two weeks. Um, and then also I have a Sabbath um, that I'm struggling to keep. But for the most part, I try to maintain that in which I shut down. Um, another thing, the biggest thing that I did for myself is I bought, I raised up teams. I raised up teams. I wasn't afraid to hire. I wasn't afraid to invest in other people, even if that meant temporarily taking a cut or, or taking a risk. It was always a risk. God would always tell me, he would say, you need to hire somebody. You need to get this person, this person, this person. I look at my bank account, it would never match up to what he was saying. I'm like, yeah, I must about to be rich or something because, you know, and then before I know it, overflow. He blow on it. So many of us are waiting for God to blow on something, but we haven't obeyed it. We haven't stacked because what you don't know is the prayer that the person that you're about to hire, what they prayed to God, what they're in need of. And so God has a responsibility to answer their prayer. So sometimes it's not even about you and your little business. It's about answering his daughter's cry for sustainability, for money, for finances. And you are, you are preventing yourself from the overall overflow by not bringing on that team member. Hiring people, that facilitates the flow of wealth in the kingdom, especially if they're a kingdom person. So those are the things that I do. <laughs> yo, yo, see, this, this is obviously not going to be the only conversation you and I have in faith. I say that in faith. <laughs> um, because, you know, I wanted to get I wanted the story, the God story, the journey, and kind of those moments when it was just you, God, and like, oh, okay, God has really <laughs> reshaped my understanding of him and my understanding of my call in the world. But there's so much more uh, that you are doing, um, but what you're doing is so much, and it's so impactful. And I, I think, I think you know, your, your name precedes you in the, na in the nature of the work and how you're helping people. And so, my sister, I'm thankful for you. On behalf of those who are who are watching, on behalf of those who are listening, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for your work. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for serving and not keeping it to yourself, uh, but really helping other people so that they may um, at least be able to push their opportunities and vision of God they're giving them forward. Uh, how, how do people find you? What's what you know? What's ahead? What's ahead? What, what do people look forward to that they can support you in? And then also, how do people find you? Oh, absolutely. So I'm always helping entrepreneurs, uh, influencers, ministry leaders. And I'm, I'm specific in saying that because I, 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 the Lord reveals to me that I'm the leader's leader. OK, so it's a certain type of person that can handle the crushing that comes with um, with what I offer. And so if you find yourself as a leader, CEO and executive uh, uh, and you're looking to write a book on uh, my company beyond the book media is ha always having something. So at any point, whether you're watching a replay of this or you're looking at this live, you can always go to beyond the book media.com and it's spelled just how it sounds beyond the book media.com. And um, you can speak with the publishing expert. We always have plenty of the opportunities and so even right now we're about to do a book write a three-day uh, map your book out challenge where we're giving people the tools and the strategies to finish their books in seven to 21 days and so that's something that we're always going to have it's been uh, it's what my company was built upon or well, god's company was built upon um that's how we entered into the uh writing space and then also, uh, and yeah, we just have so many experiences. And then myself, uh, you can find me on social media at Chanel E. Martin on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, everywhere. Clubhouse um, used to be Periscope, but they shut it down. So I'm <laughs> Chanel E. Martin on all of those spaces. So I would love to connect. I do uh, a thing called Wake Up With Chanel that was the Lord told me to do, and I didn't understand what it was, but uh, it's kept me disciplined. And I get up and uh, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on my IG, I do about 25 minute bits of inspiration, um, basically prophetic inspiration, because I literally get it as I'm speaking. Uh, so it's a it's a it's a one time uh, rainbow word, and um, I just invite you to check me out. So that's how how we can connect.
I'm thankful. I'm thankful. I'm thankful. I'm not even gonna leave you out here. We about we we about the same age, so don't feel like you're the only one on here with the age. <laughs> so don't worry. <laughs> but thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you, my sister. Speak soon.